All right, hello everyone. My name is Susan Rogers, and I'm going to be speaking today on the global financial institution sharing that has been taking place during the COVID-19 pandemic. So first, um, I would like to thank Nancy Hunter and also Don Licato for asking FSI SEC to participate and contribute to the Philadelphia Fed. Uh, annual cybersecurity conference. Um, now, cybersecurity, uh, cyber risk. You know, I thought when preparing for this uh, presentation, I thought that made me think of the old adage of everyone's a risk manager. And in financial industry, uh, we are risk managers in some form or fashion. COVID-19 has gone so far beyond a significant amount of cyber risk, of technology risk but all the other components, operational risk, industry strategic markets, all of this is what we have had to deal with. And um, trusted information sharing during the pandemic provides a means to act with speed and to bring groups together to protect uh, reputation risk, but also identify and collaborate with priorities and solutions. So that's what we're going to talk about today. There's two components uh, to this presentation. First, to share a little bit about FSI SAC. Um, when, when doing that, I can highlight the parts of uh, support that were provided so far as we continue in this global pandemic support effort. Uh, but then also jump into a timeline. So month by month, how did the sector collaborate? How did trusted sharing? Uh, what were the immediate activities? How over time did that change? So we'll go through that as well. Um, FSISEC stands for Financial Services Information Sharing and Analysis Center. And it was very descriptive. We are focused on trusted information sharing, specifically for the sector. So threats that come in, the analysis that we do are through the lens of potential disruption to the financial services and critical infrastructure that we depend upon. It is uh, the work that we do, we are run and guided by our financial industry membership. We are governed by our members. Our board of directors are comprised of members. So the priorities, the pre efforts that we continue to work on um, including all hazards, so both cyber, physical, and anything that can disrupt, disrupt the critical business services of financial services. Those are our priorities. So a little bit of background. In uh, 1999, FSI SAC was formed. Now, a couple of years later, you had uh, T -T, excuse me, the Pres Presidential Directive 63 which formed uh, a broader definition and structure for FSI, uh, for ISACs, excuse me, looking at the 16 critical infrastructure ISACs. Now, this aligns with the National Infrastructure Protection Plan, or the NIP, the folks reference. Um, the idea is that we can collaborate, you know, what FSI ISACs can do is form this foundation of trusted sharing, we collect information, a central repository for government information or private sector information, and we're facilitating that sharing capability. We also provide the tools that, that, that allow trusted confidential sharing to take place. So FSISEC has a global membership. There are over 7,000 members all countries, uh, not all countries, we're speaking uh, many countries, uh, 70 jurisdictions, 50 countries. Our staff is located across the globe as well. We have over 22 staff members that are outside of the U.S. Uh, we have, uh, they exist in uh, locations such as Canada, Brazil, U.K., uh, EU countries, uh, Singapore, Australia, and Japan. And there's a good reason for that. We are able to provide members specific, uh, understandable threat and detail. So that idea of understanding ground truth. Now, this especially was uh, an interesting concept with COVID. 
very early on, our own staff were telling us what was going on, what they were hearing within their APAC countries. Uh, now, also, obviously, we work with other the members uh, throughout the COVID process. So, um, in, in terms of membership, uh, the next part I want to talk through is who are the members that participate in SSI set. So in 2013, we had a significant growth in membership, and that was really driven based on the financial service DDoS events, 2013-14. So it, what you saw with this huge uh, growth was information security focus, a lot of CISO, CISO metric de network defenders. But over time, we have seen this grow. So you have risk managers, you have legal, you have audits, uh, specialists, uh, communicators. And the reason for this is FSISAC facilitates over 40 communities of interest. And these are groups with similar interests, similar risk components and, and, and charters. And they're able to collaborate. Uh, there are monthly routines. There are various reports. There are best practices that they collaborate on. So really, it would, this gives us an opportunity. It's great with uh, speaking to all of you is to make it aware, uh, get more folks involved in these various communities. Member benefits, a lot of these will be discussed as part of the timeline, so I won't go into depth. But you know, overall, what's really important is the concept of anonymous sharing. So FSI facts facilitate and protect the reputation risk. Uh, this, as well as the real-time sharing, um, members sharing the information, information coming from the analysts within FSI SAC, significant effort around exercising. So we partner with U.S. Treasury. We partner with other trade organizations to participate in pretty significant disruptions uh, and scenarios. And um, what we then do is look at the lessons learned, uh, work with our members on what would they like to do with these lessons learned, how can they expand their own sector or corporation's readiness based on these sector exercises. So the FSI SEC has three sectors. They group services in three categories. Okay? So you have intelligence, resilience, and trust. Intelligence are the, the core of awareness, right? So cyber threats, physical threats, a deep dive into spotlight intelligence reports. And there's a C-level, too. There's an executive report every month aimed at the CEO, CRO, CIO, et cetera. And event-driven response. So not only do we have uh, multiple threat calls throughout the month, we have uh, we will activate for specific types of events. And again, you'll we'll see that come out and highlighted in our funding. The whole idea behind this is to facilitate the peer to patient. The resilience. So resilience is what do you do before an event? How do you get ready for it? What do you do when the event is unfolding and then afterwards? So it's not just preparing and exercising. We have activated, so FSI sets has a playbook. We have activated for COVID, and we'll see parts of that described uh, in our timeline. So the trust goes back to that idea of communities of interest. So we have, oh, first of all, live events, right? We have uh, four summit events in multiple countries throughout the year. And the goal there is to get to know, to develop trust and relationships. So that's been a little tricky through uh, COVID. Uh, we do have virtual summit events that are been, one, a few of them are coming up. So uh, you can get more information out on that as well. Communities of interest go back to that idea of 40 plus like communities. So these groups, um, first of all, you can nominate additional people within the organization to join them. You join monthly routines, you trust, there are uh, secure chat, there are surveys that we uh, constantly will you know, identify, uh, and a lot of value for the survey of our membership is what our members will contribute to. And then viewpoints. 
and uh, there's an ongoing webinar, webinar series that allows us to bring best practices uh, to our members. Right, and uh, getting to the last, <laughs> before we get into the timeline, so this is a really important aspect of public, private, trusted sharing, right? The whole concept of, now on the green side, we have the U.S. partnerships. And on the blue side, we have what are those partnerships from a global aspect? How do we expand? You can look at these two illustrations from a standpoint of the relationships we develop, how do we constantly build and expand, and we, meaning the FSI SAC, how do we expand those connection points so that when information, when an event unfolds, we're able to draw that information from these sources. And the other side of it is to ask about answers that our members need, right? So I'll align this with what's happening with COVID. On the green side, so local in the U.S., we have a private sector and public sector. So part of the FSI SAC playbook is to pull together what's known as a core executive response group. So this is the leadership of the sector. This um, began meeting very quickly. It expanded into a specialized crisis management team, and we have representatives from all of these groups, from uh, private and public sector, regulators, treasury, um, DHS represented, as well as all of the major industries, uh, trade groups. So not just CISMA, but the ABA, ICBA, CUNA, um, BTI, uh, which is their technology arm of BITS. So sorry about all the acronyms. Um, but one thing to saying is a lot of that, many of you may be connected with those. This is your entree into what I'm going to talk about is through those trade organizations if you aren't already participating with them. And the other side of this is, again, think of um, the relationships we build. So we have other ISACs. There's a National Council of ISACs that we participate in. I, I join calls weekly as well as monthly. We collaborate every single day. We're sharing information from other sector viewpoints. Now, the benefit to members, they are going to get that. They go into our portal, our share. They will see reports from electricity ISAC, auto ISAC, health ISAC, information that's shared, they're able to look broader on cross-sector potential disruption. Um, the tri-sector is a special playbook we developed, a uh, special relationship with, regarding finance, communication, and electricity. So when an event is unfolding, we have the means, simple couple pages of playbook that identifies here's how you get together, here's what we can do, now, that playbook has been activated. Uh, we activated during the 2017 hurricanes. Uh, we activate it now. It meets, uh, it met a pretty significant early in COVID days uh, on a weekly basis. Now it's up to each month. And we're able to share, well, what are the priorities? Are there any priorities for the sectors that overlap, that align? And then on the right-hand side, when we look at globally, again, how do we build relationships? and then how do we use them as an event um, and it unfolds to support members. So how we build them, we're constantly, our, our global intelligence team, 22 countries are located, we're constantly moving out to develop more relationships from different countries, uh, working with different trade associations, and um, give you examples here. So with uh, UK Finance, is the centralized trade association for UK in finance. So we um, we have met with them very early on. We had co-presentations. -pres co FSI SAC participates in Bank of England, the various uh, crisis coordination efforts that they have. Um, and in terms of how we respond, in terms, say, say we have a member, uh, say you wake up and you hear on the news there is an event unfolding in another country, cyber, physical event, and you're concerned about how does this affect my institution? What activities should I be looking at? How much risk exists? FSI SAC will receive questions from members. We will reach out. We will reach out to our own U.S. sources of government. We will reach out to other country search and pose those requests for information. So that idea of being able to connect with source information is what this slide um, and the foundation of public-private trusted sharing is about. 
All right, we'll jump into the timeline. All right, this is, um, as the pandemic unfolded, what did the sector collaborate on? Uh, what were the challenges and what were the priorities? So this is very much an overview slide. We're going to review and look at each month. All right, January and February. Uh, the theme here very early on was what do we know? Um, how do we find out what we need, both from an individual company as well as a sector? Are we ready? So what you see are very early on, we were um, our own staff as well as the global members were communicating about the need to activate, to look at this new virus, to understand does it have the potential for a pandemic uh, level? What do they need to do? What continuity plans should they be activating? Um, what do we know about when we, we as an industry studied pandemic planning, prepared for it in 2006, 2007, very significant deep dives. And regulatory-wise, we had to prepare our pandemic plans. We exercised those plans. So what we did, we used some examples. So in actually on January 28th, FSISAC hosted an all-member uh, global invitation to meeting. Um, SIFMA participated. They invited their members. We had U.S. Treasury on the call uh, leading dialogue along with uh, SIFMA and FSISAC. We had um, the health uh, HHS that participated. So it was an opportunity to give a status of what we know, um, resources that our members can be looking at, the different exercise results, uh, other tools they may want to pull out of muffles, okay, and also the Q and A. Um, there is a link. We, we recorded all these sessions so that if people want to go back and listen uh, broader, we could spread the message around what we were learning in these events. Uh, we wanted to be able to encourage that. So a lot of Q and A very early on. Uh, the focus on you know, what is the concern about work from home. Uh, this very early on. The, the members were talking about this. Well, what about connectivity, last mile concerns? Uh, what then happened um, on January 30th was the activation of the sector coordination effort. So on the previous slide, talked about how uh, the private sector and financial as well as government uh, very early on. It was a very small dialogue and then very quickly expanded to a broader crisis management team and there was consistent meeting. So the goal there, how do they elevate what the priorities of the sector are? Trade organizations were on that call. They were able to communicate the challenges their members were having. Um, and you'll see as we go through this timeline that as all of the, the changes of the economic stimulus and the challenges that bank institutions were having, that was also the opportunity to escalate that and to coordinate at the, the higher sector level. Um, other, there's again a lot happening in these early months. Um, we were able, almost every threat call within FSI SEC, we closed many of them, um, all of the cyber calls had an aspect of COVID concern or COVID briefing. Um, so we have multiple viewpoints of that. And then each of, we have uh, America's threat calls, APEX threat calls, NIA threat calls, and even Latin America later in, um, in our timeline here. So all was very focused on the regional view. What specifically do they need? And then what questions they have of the broader, the systemic concerns throughout the uh, sector. So whenever you see the, uh, we have here on February 12th, we have a spotlight call. So FSI like uses that term of spotlight calls, spotlight analysis reports, to really focus on one specific event or threat. Um, where another thing we really tried to emphasize was partnership. So throughout all of these activities, it may say FSI SAC is located, but wherever possible, we brought in trade groups or their um, priorities, their membership. Um, and again, I mentioned them earlier: CISMA, IDA, ICDA, 
and then other global um, trade groups as well. So one of the early things that folks wanted, and what also sits underneath this, are these trading, are the communication channels that are besides that facilities. We have group listservs. We have um, chats, secure chats. So all of this going back and forth, um, members can communicate immediately. If there's an event, I will immediately go to the FSI SEC list search and, and see, you know, is there dialogue? What are the community institutions talking about? Are they concerned about a certain topic? So that ability of live sharing um, was constantly unfolding throughout the end of January and February. Uh, concerns about um, do, do people have exercise templates they can share? What are the concerns about uh, last mile for the communication? Um, are, and then on the community side, are people, you know, should, as it gets worse, are you going to close your lobbies? Are you going, the concept of PT, so all of those future concerns and threats, there really was a lot of dialogue around that in England. And um, the 2007, uh, there was U.S. Treasury as well as financial trade groups sponsored a pandemic exercise. It, it happened over multiple days really valuable. It's actually out there on open source, the resulting report. They looked at three or three categories of the sector, the potential impact of the pandemic on markets, on banking, and on uh, insurance. And what we were able to do is bring the actual leaders um, of that effort. They, uh, on February 25th, they joined a call. They were available for Q&A. And what they also did was share what was the difference between 2007 and now. So I'm not going to go into all the detail, but you know, again, that early discussion for members and then encouraging folks to listen to the recording of these, so to pass that information on throughout the session. All right, we'll jump into March. So, uh, you know, it's funny, the themes for these months, it's get ready, get set, and go. And you know, March was very much an unfolding of, uh, I included on here, you know, what were some key activities that were happening in our environment, what the uh, World Health Organization was doing, uh, the travel restrictions we were seeing. So you look at all those events and you know, okay, Banks were concerned about their travel coordination, about critical third parties that would be disrupted, about a supply chain. I mean, you can go on and on. That kind of concern, these are the topics that came into our dialogues, the trusted sharing. Um, one of the things that FSISAC did, we had uh, four, what we called them, sprint exercises. Um, but what they were is this idea of how could we create a broad uh, Bridgeline call, invite as many members as interested, and have them regional. So we had a sprint exercise for uh, focus on North America, then on EMEA, then on APAC, and Latin America. And with that focus, um, bringing this idea of what people aren't yet talking about. Okay, so really, what is that next stretch concern so the, again, that, that idea of engaging people um, in the very first one, we talked a lot about work remote. Uh, we had some issues around uh, staffing concerns about regulatory challenges. What we, you know, what about the essential workers that have to go into their locations? What are the requirements they need? So that whole, you know, again, you go back, you look at these things, and you see this trend of members really challenging the priorities coming up. Um, the other thing, we started a daily physical threat brief around COVID, and that is available to all members. Um, it's a combination of market inf of news information, but also the analysis. What does this mean to our sector? We, um, one of the things I have here is we have champion sharers, okay? Um, there were a couple folks in, I can't, I'm not going to use their names, uh, their companies, but I'll tell you, they were just extraordinary and have continued to be extraordinary. One individual in particular, every other day, he is publishing from a cyber viewpoint. These are the concerns. These are the risks. These are the points of interest. And it's a cumulative document. Um, the other gentleman, who is both cyber and continuity leader, 
um, published something very similar on the business on the business operational resilience side. So you have these people in the industry pushing out their thoughts, their priorities, and those go out every day in many cases. Um, the other thing to let you know, so we have special, we opened up in, in March specialized listservs. We invited both cyber and physical experts to join that same dialogue. So you have this, uh, you know, rather than a lot of times those folks are separate, but that dialogue going back and forth um, is constantly underway. And they have that ability to share to a very broad group. Uh, the other, so there are some, a little bit of explanation around physical threat level, cyber threat level. The FSI SAC, as we convene our members and we talk about current threats, we have a concept called uh, physical threat level and cyber threat level. So, and it's very much in the direction, it's directed by members. Um, the physical threat level was raised in March. Um, later on in the next month, we have the cyber threat level that was being raised. And what helps us do is really dialogue. The members will dialogue why they feel there's increased threat and uh, potential for uh, impact to the sector. And it really is a vehicle to make others aware. So we're pushing that information out. We're letting folks, encouraging them to share this with their sectors, or excuse me, their, their organizations. So we also had a lot of surveys. Uh, we had a survey around third-party risk, what were people concerned about, and especially India, other external, um, when we saw the different travel restrictions coming in, uh, systemic risk, et cetera. Um, a lot of surveys, both from cyber as well as physical. Okay. Now, towards the end, this is where we started to see the concern around essential workers. Um, one thing that's very noteworthy is uh, DHS CISA. Okay, so a lot of coordination by CISA to have one place where industry can ask questions and they get answers. So that was really strong within COVID and continues to be that way. Both CISA, uh, the, they call it the ESF uh, program, Man program Management Office, as well as uh, FEMA, the NBEOC, National Business Emergency Operations Center. So those groups have been very involved in ongoing recurring meetings. Um, I think it's noteworthy here because those whole idea of how the states, right, what do we see with COVID, the governors, the states, all of this individual separation of guidelines, of closures, of allowance of who is an essential worker, all that was extremely challenging. And what happened then when we go into April is uh, the financial service leaders, the trade organizations were drawing that information, what do their members need? What are those priorities around essential access, uh, protective equipment, uh, procedures of how members, or how they interact with their customers. So in many cases, we escalated that. It was escalated to DHS. They were in turn escalating that at the different state level and governor level. All this was, um, you know, what we had is the trusted sharing taking place within our membership as well. We had, um, we launched Connect, which is the secure chat. Um, that was actually really encouraged by our members. They wanted additional forms of, of communication. And uh, we had a second exercise, and this was broader. We included more of the trade groups, um, their viewpoint on challenges and concerns. Uh, we also started talking about impact, personal impact. Um, how you're dealing with staff, the challenges of working remotely. And um, again, we'll keep going, but a, a lot more pushing towards what are the next steps. And as early as April, we were also talking about return to normal operations. What do people think about that? And we expanded that globally. So even though that was a regional within the Americas, we encouraged APAC and AMU members to join that exercise. So the TIC stands for Threat Intelligence uh, Committee. That group, uh, trusted sharing group, is made up of CISOs, a pretty significant group, and when it comes to uh, recommending or their responsibility of how they support the sector, they recommended raising the cyber threat level and 
Yeah, what's noteworthy also is all, all of the increased cyber risk that is represented with this massive move to work from home um, structure. So all the new technologies that were brought in, how quickly they were brought in, the, when you think of the NIST cybersecurity framework controls, um, where, how do you look at those differently? Are the controls, um, are they, do they need to be expanded based on what we know? So those are the types of elements, plus the focus very early on. Uh, the bad guys want to, to focus and use COVID uh, for increased fraud. Um, all of this was a part of our threat analysis. And um, we did publish, at the site I published a work from home cyber practices document, a spotlight report, uh, recommend, it's really recommendation on how um, you could look into your organization and what additional things should you be looking at. So moving on in May, um, we continued the CERC, uh, these core executive response group, this crisis management team, really significant, important, uh, activities during May. We in, expanded to have a separate working group that focused on return to normal operations. You know, what were the major cities where there was concern? How do we monitor this? What are the priorities of, uh, our, of the sector? And uh, again, the acronym uh, FISIC, which is the Financial Services Coordinating Council, they focused on uh, collaborating on a white paper around return to normal operations. Now, what's not noted here, but what was going on behind the scenes was uh, DHS CISA. There is a sector coordination uh, leadership group that was getting together and also discussing uh, return to normal operations, the priorities, trying to find overlaps across sectors. And um, yeah, it, it's, that continues. The return to normal operations continues. and. What we are now looking at is actually uh, other countries, the second waves that are they are seeing. How does that impact these plans for return to office? Uh, Ceres is a community. Um, this is one of the communities of interest that focuses on um, the uh, excuse me the central banks. So we have um, it represents uh, the name for Ceres is the central banks, regulators, and supervisors, and this is. A community FSISAC was asked to start. Uh, it's fairly new, so the idea of the monthly, um, it's actually run by the folks in our European um, division, and they come up with topics. What are other uh, central banks interested in? What topics can they collaborate on? And, and all this is obviously we have the walls between the trusted sharing of this group and the other uh, private sector groups. So in terms of, um, you know, again, more and more connections that we were making outside of the U.S., um, a lot on the cyber side, real focus around uh, disinformation activity on fraud. You have unemployment starting to really creep. You have the talk about the stimulus and the role that we would play, at the banking institutions would play in helping the Americans, uh, our average American who's going to be trying to get that stimulus money and, and use it, as well as the unemployment concerns and fraud that we were seeing coming up beginning of May and then really going through in future months. So when we have um, in June and really in July, a lot of these really have consistent priorities. So we focus more on um, how do we engage more outside of the U.S. Uh, bring in APAC member membership, uh, EMEA, we were having more and more collaboration with UK Finance, with Bank of England, um, looking at uh, Latin America as they lose, you know, we see the significant spike now in growth in Latin America and Mexico, we wanted to be able to support that, so we had a specialized um, exercise event in, um, you know, in those, not in English, okay, so we have um, bilingual, multilingual staff that facilitated those exercises, or that exercise. And a lot of emphasis on connect, right? So we hosted this uh, Follow the Sun Live Connect event. It was in five different, uh, it was facilitated in five different countries, five different time zones, and, and 
a series of questions were prepared. It was very interesting how people were engaging. Um, and again, the topics were similar to the exercises. What are the next things that, next priorities? What are your concerns? A lot of talk there about the regulatory um, exceptions, requirements, a lot of focus around um, return to normal operations as well. Okay. Uh, again, ongoing around return to normal operations. Um, you know, what we also saw, and not only with the economic stimulus and the unemployment activities taking place in the U.S., but we had the coin shortages, and that was other countries as well. So uh, going back to the sector coordination crisis management team, we were able to have dialogue and updates. Um, ABA was very involved in the coordination and the working groups that the, excuse me, that the Fed Reserve has um, facilitated to support the coin, coin shortage, and also ICBA in some of these more specific collaborative efforts. Uh, what else is worth here? Um, these are continuing. So this idea of how do we continue to deal with the unemployment fraud now, and specifically working with the states that have, have really dealt directly. Um, they've been the ones that have, have the source of the unemployment fraud through the states. And how can we collaborate with them when uh, we see the monies uh, transferring through banks? So. The issue also of um, when you look at what's happened in the United States in terms of um, face masks and the challenges and all of the various um, activities that have really the idea of how do we work with um, the public and what we saw a lot of, um, much of the dialogue between members is how are you dealing with uh, traffic? How are you dealing with folks that don't want to wear face masks? What are your policies in these different states that are seeing spikes? Are you reinstituting um, different, more uh, restrictive policies and procedures and as that spike increases? Um, we had increased uh, surveys in terms of uh, vendor planning, third-party supply chain challenges, uh, remote working, and um, there's a lot more to talk about on third-party supply chain. We'll keep going. So the focuses from the return to normal working group were um, transportation, child care, uh, the major cities that and where they were in their um, COVID levels. And there's specific uh, ICDA, for instance, has worked on fraud cases. Because again, this is all about how do we look at these issues? What are the priorities? Now, how do we get the information to members? in forms that are helpful to them, right, in education formats, webinars, case studies, uh, training, et cetera. So that's an example of we may meet at the high level or at this coordination level, but how does the information get out to folks that can use it? Uh, webinars also brought in, um, and we have, uh, the follow, again, the Follow the Sun live chat, additional activities, additional topics that were managed. So um, we're going to stop at September, although we are in October now. Um, you know, the focus right now truly is how, how do we live with COVID over the period of um, the rest of the year? And then how do we, what do we do in 2021? What are our strategies for planning for um, what level of recovery? Um, what work from home processes are going to be maintained? What are helpful? What are valuable? What new technology is going to be implemented? Um, there's a lot going on, a lot being talked about. So when it comes to um, one of the things, these are things we've done in September, the, a big key part is this COVID second wave brief. So we looked at the various countries that FSI SAC members um, of, of the FSI segment, and we took a look at, you know, tried to consistently compare COVID uh, metrics, but then also what are we hearing from members? What are the priorities? And you clearly see uh, themes and ways. We see that way in many, many countries. In the case of the U.S., as well as Mexico, well, some of those countries you see just a continuing spike up um, because of later um, impact of COVID. 
uh, in the U.S., you see this constant rolling rate. So, you know, with that said, it's helpful to step back and analyze what do we learn from this? What are our global members going to need going forward? What are their priorities? We've also started um, some planning around 2021. Um, member webinars, member um, opportunities of training to talk through what are examples of checklists and strategies and um, tools that they can use as they plan for recovery from COVID and then ongoing um, planning, how it changes business continuity and then how business continuity recovers back to what we consider a new normal. So um, there's so much more that we can provide. FSISAC uh, has significant amounts of information. Um, please feel free to contact me to, I'll get you connected to many of the tools that we talked about. And um, we do have time for questions and answers. So we'd love to hear, um, hear your thoughts. And I will hand this back to our moderator.